Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this weekly Ag Weather Forecast brought to you by Ag South Farm Credit. I want to start off with just a quick look at some satellite data on Sunday because there was two things I was watching, actually three things I was watching really carefully. The first was, I'm curious how much of the lower 48's got some snow on it. And you can kind of see the snow, which is stationary while the clouds move over the top of it. We've got a lot of the lower 48 covered right now. The second thing was the Great Lakes are almost completely ice free. We've watched some really strong flow come over the top of them. And of course, there was this lake effect snow band right here that canceled that Buffalo Bills game, or at least pushed it to later in the day here on Monday. The third thing, which is what's most important for Ag South Territory, is we cleared things out on Sunday. As you can see here, there's a lot of cold air that's coming toward us. But out ahead of it, there's this situation right in through here where we have flow coming up out of the south at the low levels, excuse me, at the mid levels, and undercutting it at the low levels is where this really, really cold air is in place. And that's gonna be the major setup for the weather systems early this week. Now, overall, for the next 10 days, we get a bit of a break in the southeast. And what's important about that is leading up to this, it's been extremely wet and extremely stormy. So this is just a look back at the last seven days of total accumulated precipitation through Sunday morning uh, here across uh, across the whole U.S. And we'll see uh, new data coming out tomorrow for this map just to show us how much moisture we got. But the idea was this, the flow kind of came in, invigorated new low pressure systems here, and we had one two last week that rolled almost right in the same location. The third one's a bit farther to the south and it's slowly spreading its way toward the Appalachian Mountains, which, which means we are gonna add more to this, but not, not a whole lot. Now, thinking about all of that, I do wanna rewind the clock and just show you back on the 9th, we had a pretty sizable severe weather outbreak, almost 500 reports of severe weather, including 25 tornadoes, and this hit Ag South territory really hard. Thankfully, the system that followed it later in the week did not produce the same level of severe weather, I'm talking about last week, than the one we had on the 9th, but that was a pretty rough go. Thinking about it though, that moisture that's in place, I wanted to show you something that's kind of important for the midsection of the country. The Mississippi River, as of late on Sunday night, was now 10 feet above low stage. Now look at the jump it made at the very end here. Going into the weekend, it was still two feet below low stage. That water has now gotten into the river. There's been a lot of flooding that's caused this, but 10 feet, what a massive jump. So I just wanna keep you aware of that situation going on in the central United States. Now, as we press forward, you probably were watching the news on Sunday night and you heard about maybe coming out of parts of Nashville or out of Memphis or out of parts of the Mid-South here, the, the snow and the ice that was kind of rolling through this area. Brutally cold air undercutting warm moist air aloft and that set this up. And what this is going to do is it's going to continue to push toward the Appalachian Mountains. Each of the I or excuse me, the uh, polygons you see here represents where we still have flooding from last week. That's what these are representing flood warnings in these particular areas. But this is the very cold air that's advancing toward us this week and it will get here and really drop those temperatures off. Now you're not going to experience what much of the rest of the country got, which was, well, I mean, I live right here in Champaign, Illinois, just outside of it. We had wind chills on Sunday morning of minus 35. We saw wind chills as cold as minus 50 to minus 60 in the Northern Plains. There's a lot of cold in this air. And on Sunday, this animation is just gonna show you here. Let me, there it goes. It's showing you every location that either approached or tied or set a new record for low temperatures. So just wanna give you an idea on the extent of the cold air that's coming through. Now, just thinking about bigger picture things, we had a multi-day blizzard that hit parts of the Midwest. We need this moisture badly. Just to give you an idea, if you're a corn and soybean farmer down here, the state of Iowa, in the last four years, parts of it are over 40 inches in deficit for, for precipitation. So these blizzards that have come through, two of them really in the last uh, seven or eight days, which have added a lot of snow. This is just the most recent one, okay, that added all that snow. That's gonna be moisture that will be there to be melted and put into the ground as this all goes over miles next week. Next week is when it's going to go over mild. I want to show you snow in a couple other ways. This is the season to date snowfall map. So you can kind of see that we've had some snows that have gotten into Virginia and the Appalachian Mountains, but most of, of Axel territory has been void of really, really cold air until what you've got coming up and then the risk of getting some snow. Another way to look at it is to get an idea based on percent of normal. So I, I what I do is I take the average and then compare it to this year and then you assign a percentage to that. And so you can clearly see that that we have yet to, um, excuse me, yet to get, um, you know, big snows into this section of the country. Now, here's the setup. This is what the pattern looks like on Monday morning. The cold front has made it all the way into the Gulf. It's sitting right in through this area. So there's all this cold air that's been pushing through these states toward us all weekend long. Now, if I take this and step you up just a mile above our heads, 
take a look what's going on here. You see the flow is coming around this big high here. And what it's doing is it's running over the top. So there's cold air undercutting, you just saw that, and warm air running over the top. And that's what's giving you kind of the banded nature in the temperature profile of the lower atmosphere. And it's got this risk of ice. Now, I'm recording this late on Sunday night, so a lot of this is happening on Sunday night before you're going to see the video. But I just want to let you know that between Dallas and Houston, stretching across Louisiana and Mississippi, over, you know, still going into tomorrow or into Monday morning, we're going to be looking at the risk of ice in this area. But let's flip this over to snow because, as you see, we get into Ag South Territory right now for the next three days. I'm not too, too worried about major ice accumulations. But on the snow side of it, let's let this reset. Here's the best chance. Let's kind of zoom in there and just have a closer look. This is the best chance of getting two inches of snow. There we go. And let's go ahead and step it up to four. So you notice it's primarily going to be on the western facing slopes of the Appalachian Mountains, of the Blue Ridge Mountains. So this is going to be flow coming in over the top, but we're probably going to stay away from the heavier precipitation here. And the real reason for that is because this is not a low that's like curling up and just racing up these coasts like each you know day kind of making its advancement in this direction. No, no, no. This is just overrunning. So the flow is coming up like this and there's surface flow cutting underneath it like that. That's the setup for this particular snow event. But it's going to make a mess of parts of the Mid-South toward the Appalachian Mountains, the Blue Ridge Mountains. And, uh, and, and, and we will get some rain throughout the Piedmont here, but it's not a whole lot overall. So I want to show you what it looks like. Let's just play this for. Let's get you queued up here. This is, um, I'm sorry about that. This is uh, starting early Monday morning. So you can see the snow spreading. There's the ice still left over from Sunday night, still getting into this region. The snow could get into Virginia. It could clip parts of North Carolina. But playing through midday Monday, getting into Monday evening, it's going to be scattered showers out ahead of this. The snow will be mainly on the western side of the mountains here and the ice stays there as well. I'm not overly concerned at this point about a major icing event, even into early Tuesday morning. You can start to see maybe some of the risk of some freezing rain, but it's not, the, the cold air damming isn't there. We just don't have the, the high pressure pulling in that cold air to set out ahead of this. Now, there is a lot of cold air coming in behind it, and that will be here soon enough this week. But we're going to get a bit of a break after this, okay? Now, to show you where this is all going to go, let me just give you the 10-day picture. This is from the European model run on Sunday. And overall, we have a drier outlook. And we need it. We actually do need to back off a bit on the moisture that has recently come in and give us some time to recover from some, from some of the local flooding. And then we'll go back over to an active pattern, I think, soon enough. We'll show you when in just a few moments. But let's kind of double up on our models here. GFS on the left, European on the right. We've already seen system number one. So there it is spreading the ice threat through Monday into early Tuesday, and now we just get out past it and high pressure builds in through Thursday. And what we'll have to watch is as that high pressure, which starts off here, okay, as it starts to move its way out to the ocean, what you get around it will be some return flow. So we're going to be watching Thursday night getting into Friday, a week low that could press again in here. There will be cold air in place. We'll be talking about the risk of getting some snow in this area. We'll take a close look at how much in just a second. But it'll be rain in parts of Georgia and South Carolina. But right now, these aren't huge rainfall totals. Another surge of colder air coming in behind this one okay, for the end of this week and the weekend. And then the high pressure settles right over the top of us by the end of the weekend. And then into early next week, we see the same thing. The high moves over here. It's in both models. See the high moving there? That's going to open, oops, sorry, that's going to open up the flow and start kicking off new systems as we work our way out there to the 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Now, what that means is week two is going to be much wetter than week one. Okay, so the next seven days, we got really two chances of getting some moisture. But then beyond that, I'm thinking it's going to open right back up again. All right, how about some snowfall totals? I'm going to start you off with the GFS model. This is playing you know, through this week, and you can see that possibly snowfall totals, if you use the 10 to 1 ratio, could be relatively high in this. If I flip this over to the ECMWF, uh, there you go. You got a good idea on what its snowfall totals look like. In fact, let's go back to the 12Z run so I can take it a little farther so we can get that second system in there. There you go. So now you can see parts of Virginia adding some snow. We could get a dusting of snow in parts of North Carolina. Most of it, though, stained in the mountains. Uh, I can show you another map uh, from the Germany's Icon model. And once again, heaviest snows here getting into parts of Virginia, but just take a look. Maybe a chance for some dusting of snow in this part of North Carolina once the cold air finally does arrive here. All right. But on the precipitation side, I'm going to stick with the euro on this. 
because I think it's got the best handle. That's through Wednesday. So notice, not a whole lot. We could get maybe up to a half inch in southern Georgia, more into Florida. Then with the extra push that comes in, there's the second round. That would be the one that's Thursday into Friday. Still not a whole lot of moisture. When we'll be watching for the next big push, we'll be fully into week two. So there it is. And that's why I showed you the next 10 days overall, not looking at a whole lot of additional moisture. There's three chances of rain, but it's not like these are heavy, heavy rainfall across Axel territory. Now, if we did look at the probabilities of things, how about the chance of getting three inches of snow? So that's what you're looking at here. And those higher level amounts over the next 10 days are primarily going to be confined once again on the Tennessee side of the, uh, of the Blue Ridge Mountains. But on the wetter side of things, let's just go have a look here at surface precipitation. Ah, no, let's do probabilities. Uh, probability, uh, there it is. Sorry, <laughs> I kind of got disoriented there with my maps. How about the chance of getting over an inch? Over a tenth of an inch. Here's over an inch. I'm sorry, I keep clicking the wrong button. You can see our probabilities of getting an over an inch of liquid in the next 10 days are pretty low. It all comes on after that. See it? That's what's happening. So what are we looking at here? From now till about the 23rd, maybe, we're drier. About up to the 23rd. And then after that, moisture starts to return in a big way. Okay. Now, just putting this moisture into context, this is what since uh, December 1 through January 14th, precipitation ranks by climate district have looked like. Now, there's a lot going on here. We've lately brought in more moisture to what had been extremely dry in December, which is the Mid-South. But look at North Carolina. A lot of single digits here. That means that this 45-day stretch of weather is right now looking like a top five wettest in, in history. And our history goes back 132 years with data collection here. Look at South Carolina. Look at Georgia. Very, very wet. This was the drought-busting you know, implications I was talking about. And lately, we brought a lot of moisture in here. Now, out here in the Midwest, in the Plains, this is also critical to the success of the 2024 growing season. Massive flooding up the East Coast over the weekend. Of course, I'm sure you saw a lot of that in the news as this deep low curled itself up. That's what's helping keep many of these reporting districts here really, really wet at those you know, number one levels here. So I just wanted to point that out. But the bigger thing I'll be watching is this. Now, keep an eye out on this. By the time we get to this weekend, this upcoming weekend, the jet stream will start in the Sahara, go through India, hit China, come out over Japan, go north of Hawaii, and go right into Mexico. See that? That means with flow for most of this next week coming over the top and then down, and the faster flow staying to the south... That's why we have kind of fewer chances of getting good moisture. But watch this. Starting again, what I say? The 23rd? There it is. The 23rd, 24th, 25th. Do you see what the atmosphere did? The jet retracted. There's the fastest part. Broke up into a trough, ridge, trough, ridge. And that's flow that's out of the southwest. That's why things start to pick up into week two. And every forecast model, the CPC, the European, and the GFS, bring it all back in. When does it start again? About the 23rd. The 23rd is when I expect things to get really active once again. All right? That's your short-term precipitation outlook. How about temperatures? We've got a lot of cold air coming. We could get frost all the way down to central Florida, but the west is going to go mild first. If you're curious, Monday morning's lows, here's what they look like. We're right on average about for much of Axat territory. Still brutally cold in this area. As we go from Monday into Tuesday, still above average for us. But by Wednesday, the cold air gets here. Thursday morning's lows will be in the low 20s, upper teens. And then we got into Friday, more moderation coming. But here's round two of that cold air by Saturday. Remember, I told you we have two rounds of it coming. Now, how do things translate after this? Well, this is the day 5 through 10, so we're cooler through day 10. But mild air from the Pacific begins to flood in as colder air goes back to Alaska and Greenland at times. We go back over to a much warmer phase uh, of our pattern here toward the end of this month. Now, the thinking is, is that this warmer phase that you've got here is primarily because the Pacific Jet's coming in, it's diving and then rolling out like this. We just keep opening up to warmer air. It's not as though it's going to be warm. So don't see this and go, sweet spring shorts and t-shirt. No, no, no. This is mid to late January temperatures. So to be, you know, 10 degrees warmer than normal is still pretty cold. But that's also going to open us up to more moisture. That's why the week two looks so wet in this area. Now, there's a couple things I want you to know. The pattern's not stuck right now. There's nothing about it 
that's got me worried that it's just going to get locked into this phase of either really, really mild or really, really dry or really, really wet or really, really cold. No, the MJO has just continued its trek around. So in other words, if I showed you this graphic and I just said, ah, the MJO is just going around and around, that's good. That's a signal that the tropics are open and active and moving. And I see that right now. Okay, look at the MJO. Just over the next two weeks, going to go from phase four almost all the way to phase seven. And the other part of this is, is that El Nino is still a major component, which means that'll probably favor a stronger subtropical branch of the jet stream. And that's why we continue to see all the way through February the chances here of above average precipitation. This is almost entirely driven by, you know, El Nino being at its peak and starting to fade right now. But I want to tell you something. This isn't as though every day is going to be wet. Like I just showed you, we really go through our next 10 days kind of with a bit of a break, and then it comes back on again. That's the way I think this pattern is going to be all the way through February and into March and even into April. We get a big movement uh, where the flow opens up and things constructively add together to give us a big chance at rainfall, and then we kind of back things off. What I am waiting on is the timing of what we call antecedent cold air, cold air that gets in place before we get a big Miller A or Miller B storm system through, which would then give us the chances for some real widespread snow in the southeast. Don't see that happening in the near term. I just don't. It's not happening in the near term, but maybe later. Okay, other things just to point out here. There's the MJO movement. Anytime I draw on this diagram and I put an arrow that shows slant, that means it's open and it's moving. And this is going to come up again at the end of this forecast video because the blue green, green represents rising motion and clouds and precipitation. And this is primarily in the tropics, which means Toward the end of the month, Brazil's looking at wet conditions again. I'll come back to that in a second. But I came to this page mainly for one thing. And it's actually slide down and show you this. You see, this is from today all the way through the end of the month. A Havmuller diagram, that's what we call them, showing us winds right here across the planet, but in the tropics. Now, if El Nino had its grip on this pattern, okay, everything between what I'm kind of putting bounds here would all be red. Those would be big westerly wind bursts. Instead, the trade winds have cranked back up again. That's not typical of an El Nino. Now, I'm telling you that because our long-range forecasts are very El Nino-like, okay, with the jet stream doing something like that and the polar jet coming over the top like this. But the idea here is that I don't want you to get settled into a pattern that's just nonstop rain going forward. It seems to come and go in, in waves because the more dominant factor is that MJO. But where is this El Nino going? Because right now it has reached uh, this peak. Well, the CPC on Friday suggests that this El Nino event is going to last through the remainder of winter, be there, even though it's at its peak and starting to fade. And then once we get into spring and summer, the highest probabilities go back to being La Nina. Now, it is most aggressive of all of the forecast centers on redeveloping a La Nina. And that's a bit of a, a tricky longer-term forecast. And the reason I stress this is because the pace, the speed at which El Nino collapses, is going to be critical to all of our long-range forecasts. Now, as it stands, they all want to keep it wet. You've already seen this. February, March, April. March, April, May, wet. Tight, tight spring windows. April, May, June, wet. May, June, July, still wet overall. But you start to notice that as we get towards late spring and summer that the models are trying to pick up on some drier risk in the plains. And I'm specifically talking to cotton farmers. I am concerned about the risk of a drier summer and a hotter summer in the western plains right now. That's one of the bigger concerns about this pattern. I'm also concerned that once we get deep into our hurricane season, that if this El Nino collapses, and this goes over to La Nina, but the Pacific, excuse me, the Atlantic stays warm, our hurricane risk goes up. And we're all very worried about that right now just because it's one of the stronger signals. But we did get some more data in last week that I want to share with you. Precipitation rate using the National Multimodel Ensemble for spring. Notice how it's already gathering in the drier conditions here, but keeping them wet over Ag South territory. Let's go back and look again. How about out here season three, which would be April, May, June. Still wet, but drier west. Let's do this one more time. Let's go out to season four, which would be May, June, July. Still wet, drier here. You see, there's a pretty consistent signal right now in the models that I can't ignore. As this El Nino fades, we just need to ask what it could possibly do in terms of kind of bifurcating the country almost right on this line for wet east and drier west. 
Now, what happens in reality is going to be different from this, but it's an early season indicator on what we should be watching. Okay, I want to finish up with some international weather. This is just a quick look at global temperatures. You can kind of take this all in to see our cold spots and our hot spots across the country, across the world. But I want to give you also the precipitation outlook too. Notice, very wet in Indonesia, very wet in northern uh, parts of Australia and in eastern Australia. Why? That's where the MJO is right now. It's right here. Phase 3, 4, 5, and 6. That's where it's going to be hanging out. It's wet in Asia, this part of Asia, China. It's wet in most of Europe. It's wet in parts of Southern Africa and South Africa. But take a look at South America. Now, why dry right now? Because of where the MJO is. It's suppressing the rising motion in this area. But the last two weeks have been very wet in this region. Now, what's the context? This area, right in through here, in October, November, December, was record dry. We've not had a drier stretch going all the way back to when the data sets begin in 1940. So now to see all the wet weather come in here, we want to know, is it going to go back over dry and stay dry, or is there a risk of going wet? I think either poses a problem. And this is my case. You see, we do expect drier conditions to return and warmer conditions to return. But the reality is we actually need that. This area has to start getting a little drier so they can harvest the crop quickly at the end of January through the month of February. They're talking about first crop soybeans. But right now, the longer range forecasts want to sweep the MJO around such that by the last week of the month, we're going to bring wet rain, or wet rain, excuse me, wet conditions, heavy rain, back into an area that they want to be doing rapid harvest. Now, that could be a problem. That could push the crop calendar down the road. That could put safrina crop getting planted later. And we're already expecting a little bit smaller safrina crop for corn and cotton. Watch this carefully. If this wetter condition sticks around longer into February, that's going to delay things even further. I'll keep an eye on it. Report back to you next week. Until then, have a good rest of your week. Thanks.